Okay, so as you know, every week we have a hero, and you will not be surprised to hear that our hero this week is our guest, Dr. Joseph Farrell. He is a scholar, he is a teacher, he is an author of many books of extraordinary quality. Um, you've heard me say before, I have all of his books uh, piled up in the in the den, uh, although in, in doing the research to introduce him tonight, I discovered one that I didn't have, <laughs> but I will get it. And um, I've said to somebody before I die, my goal is to have read everything he's ever written, which means, you know, I'm going to have to keep up with him because he's writing more. Um, But if you're interested in understanding history, particularly history that is critical to understanding the forces that now run our world, I consider his books essential reading. Um, So do two things. If you do nothing else tonight, go bookmark his website. Uh, I may mispronounce it. It's Giza Star, G-I-Z-A Star. Um, and certainly take a look at his the books available on his site, and you want to start adding his books to your library, including the one we're going to talk about tonight. So uh, his work is really proof that it's a it's really a living testimony to the power of scholarship and transparency, because so much of control in our world depends on keeping our understandings muddled and confused, and this is a this is a scholar who can unpack that muddling and confusion and help you see clearly. So with that, with no further ado, Dr. Farrell, are you with us? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Catherine. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Well, I first started to read your work on, you have several books on the Nazis and Nazis technology. So first I would like to ask you, how in the world did you ever get interested in the Nazis? Maybe if you could give us <laughs> the real four well, one on who were the Nazis and what were their relationship to America during the war. Right, right. Um, well, just one quick modification. My website is www.gizadeathstar.com. Oh, Death Star, not, not I'm just, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Well, I got interested in the Nazis, um, Catherine, when I was a kid, actually, I was always fascinated. You know, I grew up in South Dakota. I was I was surrounded uh, with with Germans. You know, some of whom had been veterans. A very good friend of mine that uh, I grew up in high school had been a veteran in World War II. You know, fighting on the German side, and and after the war had emigrated to this country. So you know, I grew up curious about uh, World War II history and and delving into things, but. It really kind of got started in in terms of what we're talking about tonight when the vast scale of Nazi plunder in Europe, you know, when I became aware of it. And then on top of that, the, the vast scale of the Nazi plan, quite literally, to escape Europe with that plunder and then to put it to use. And I think kind of the turning point for me was when I, I ran across a project. This, this was years ago when I learned about this. This project that had been going on in Argentina after the war, where a top German scientist had been based and supposedly had been doing some secret fusion research for Juan Perón. And, of course, Perón kind of spilled the beans at a press conference in 1951, and there was a little bit of a, an outcry against this scientist in the world press at the time. He had been denounced and so on as a, as a fraud and, and a swindler. But what really got me was that the scale of this project seemed to exceed anything that Argentina would have been capable of doing on its own. So the next question for me became, well, all right, where's the money for this coming from? Who's actually behind this? And and in kind of following that, you know, follow the money trail, <laughs> it, kind right. of, it kind of led back to World War II and, and what had been going on toward uh, the end of World War II after the German defeat at Stalingrad and, and their plans to what they called a strategic evacuation plan, which was simply to move shop. <laughs> so that's right. kind of where it all started. Well, how how much? Well, let's let's step back because I think what is not commonly understood by many people is the cooperation that occurred at a very high level between 
the American corporate establishment and the Nazis throughout the war. Yes. So this is a, this is a little known aspect, and and you're right. Most people are unaware of this it's because it's been carefully, carefully sanitized. Um, this cooperation, Catherine, really began in a series of nexus and relationships between the wars, between some some very powerful figures in the American finance and, and corporate worlds, uh, people like Farish and Standard Oil and uh, McKittrick, who later would become part of the Bank of International Settlements, uh, people like this on the American side. And, of course, in that, you had the Dulles brothers, you know, Sullivan and Cromwell in, in, in Wall Street in New York City. All of these people developed a set of, of corporate relationships with their counterparts in Germany. And all of this, of course, was to revitalize the German economy. And eventually, of course, a lot of these corporations were financial backers of, of the Nazis and, and of Adolf Hitler. But on the German side, of course, you had people like Hermann Schmitz that eventually became the, the chairman of uh, IG Farben, and Kurt Schrader, who was a banker in, in Cologne, and also subsequently a Gestapo general. And you know, so, right. you, know you pull on this thread long enough, and you're going to see, you know, just a real den of vipers, and and there, it's kind of incestuous the way that that these corporate and financial relationships are all intertwined. And a key figure in that interwar period was, of course, the fellow that eventually would become Hitler's Reichsbank president, and that was a fellow by the name of Hjalmar Horace Greeley Schacht. And, you know, the name itself says it all. This man had been <laughs> born in America but had returned to Germany, where his, his parents had emigrated from, and then eventually, of course, uh, became a financial powerhouse in, in the Reichsbank in, in Germany. And he's a key figure in this story, Catherine, because he was one of the kind of mentors, if you will, that founded the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland, which is kind of a central bank to central banks. And he was a key figure in the founding of, of this bank, and the whole purpose of founding the bank was to manage the, the payments and settlements between Western central banks and, and the German central bank, the Reichsbank, in handling the Allied war reparations for World War I. When he helped draft the contract or, or constitution, as it were, to set up the Bank of International Settlements, one of the codicils that he insisted to be put in was that the bank would be immune from seizure or occupation by any party to any future conflict. So in other words, he was kind of anticipating the outbreak of World War II and right. wanted to make very good and sure that both the German side and the Allied side would have some way to maintain financial contact throughout the war. Now, I mentioned the Bank of International Settlements because it forms a crucial part of this whole uh, post-war uh, breakaway civilization idea. And the reason why is that during the war, the Bank of International Settlements was, was heavily under the influence of the Nazis. And they parked a bunch of their gold reserves in the Bank of International Settlements. And in addition to this, it was kind of the, the uh, point of entry for Nazi funds to flee Europe as, as the war started to turn against the Germans and then to make it from there into the major Western banks. So this is a now, very, you very have murky Dulles story. Did Switzerland working to help facilitate that Pardon during me? the war? Didn't you have Dulles in Switzerland during the war helping to facilitate that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Dulles, this is the other key part of the story. And again, it's, it's not part of the story that most Americans know. But Alan Dulles, of course, was in Switzerland as kind of the station chief for the OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA during World War II. And Dulles was assigned to Switzerland. Now, it's very important for people to follow the dots here because Dulles, of course, was a member of the prestigious firm of Sullivan and Cromwell in, in New York City. He therefore had, as a matter of course, he had several high-level banking connections. But as he was in Switzerland, 
as the war was turning against the Germans, the Germans contacted Dulles. A number of high-ranking German uh, military officers contacted him. One of them was a fellow by the name of General Reinhardt Galen. And Galen was a head of, of a military intelligence organization inside the Third Reich that was called Fremteherre Ost, which stands for Foreign Armies East. This was a vast military intelligence organization that existed in Eastern Europe and inside the Soviet Union. And he offered Dulles a bargain. And, and literally, you have to read Galen's memoirs. I cite uh, the memoirs in a book of mine called uh, SS Brotherhood of the Bell. You have to read General Galen's memoirs to, to really fully appreciate the depth of what happened in the deal that he and Dulles struck. Because what he offered Dulles was to turn over to overall American oversight and control this entire Nazi network of spies inside of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And the reason Galen did that is that he knew that the next big major geopolitical tension would be between the United States and the Soviet Union. And he also knew that the United States did not have much by way of a human on-the-ground intelligence network in that area of the world. So basically what he was offering to the United States was that Nazi military intelligence would simply continue in existence after the war and be under the nominal control of the Americans. But here, Catherine, is, is the whopper. He specified, and Alan Dulles agreed, that in instances where American and German interests would clash, that this organization would naturally look out for German interests first. And the other part of the deal was that he, General Galen, would stay in operational control, you know, the day-to-day -day management of this vast network of spies after the war. And of course, that network eventually becomes the Bundesnachrichtendienst, which is modern Germany's version of the CIA. So you have right. institutional continuity between a major Western intelligence service today and this Nazi uh, military intelligence organization. And the other thing that it means, and this, is, this I hope will uh, drive the point home for the listeners, the other major thing that this means is that no sooner had President Truman signed the National Security Act of 1947 into existence, into law, then the civilian charter of the CIA is already massively compromised because at that time what it meant was that the Soviet desk, the, the human intelligence that was being provided to the CIA, was basically being provided by a Nazi intelligence network. And the right. analysis, and this is, you know, this, this blows the mind, but the analysis of Soviet intentions and strengths was also being conducted by this group of, of Nazi spies under the control of General Galen. So it's a massive story that we're looking at. Right. This, I just, uh, last year, wrote a review of, of uh, Helms's book. I hadn't, I'd never read his biography. And uh, and he documents some of the anger and fury over this. Oh yes. Years. Yeah. Yeah. One it, of you know, my you can favorites. imagine you can you can imagine being an American military officer and learning of these deals. You know, uh, it, it, it's really rather breathtaking. But you know, for our purposes, the other thing I think we need to remember is that while these deals are being struck. Uh, with Alan Dulles and, and General Galen, there's something else happening toward the tail end of, of World War II within American intelligence, and that's the the institutionalization, so to speak, of, of what is going to become covert operations after the war. You have people like right. Frank Wisner, Ed Lansdale that are involved the in the OSS and budget. some of their covert operations. Well, these people will continue after the war. And what I'm suggesting is is that you have a nexus, really, between American covert ops and, and this uh, holdover Nazi organization after World War II that, uh, in a certain sense, to my mind, uh, kind of accounts for the rise of a fa very kind of fascist culture that we see taking place around us. 
There's a couple things I wanted to bring up at this point. One is the fact, uh, Operation Paperclip, you, you have at the same time that you have this adoption of the Nazi intelligence networks, you have an enormous amount of scientists and other professionals right. brought in and placed strategically at American universities, American foundations, American defense contractors, all to build the intellectual capital, you know, around this group of people that include the covert that you're describing. And they're very right. much a piece of the puzzle because the right. technology is part of this. Oh, yes, absolutely. The technology is, is the big story here. Um, I, like to, I like to put it this way, Catherine, when, when I talk to people about what's going on here. Toward the end of the war, it is the Nazis who are driving the division of the spoils. And what do I mean by this? If you look at what happens, you, you discover that the Soviets are making off with literally hundreds of middle echelon managers within Nazi black projects, within their secret weapons projects. These are the people, in other words, that can reconstruct for the Soviet Union the paper trail. They can reconstruct the basic ideas, all right? When you look at the American side of this equation, you discover that we're getting all of the top flight Nazi scientists. We're getting Artur Rudolph and Werner von Braun, and uh, General Dornberger and all of these people are coming to the United States. So in other words, what, what is happening here is that the Nazis are driving the division of the spoils so that there will be a stalemate, so that there will be a post-war uh, more or less balance of, of power between the Eastern and Western blocs. And the reason they're doing this, this is classical German diplomacy, you don't really have to look very far to understand it, because the reason they're doing this is that Germany has maximum diplomatic maneuvering room when precisely there is such a standoff between the East and the West. This is, right. this is classic German diplomacy, has been ever since Frederick the Great. So this is part of the explanation. But what's happening in this country, you're absolutely right. What the Nazis are doing is they are very carefully penetrating key segments of the American military-industrial complex. This, this is another vital thing that people need to understand. And I even discovered, you know, uh, in one of my books that, that I wrote, uh, I discovered that American counterintelligence after the war learned that these Nazi scientists that we had just brought over from Europe were somehow still maintaining some sort of contact, and it was through Latin America. And that just blew my mind, because what, what this meant was that we were dealing, in effect, with a kind of a Nazi extraterritorial state, no boundaries, no borders, existing within host countries. In other words, we're dealing with a kind of a breakaway civilization already. And, you know, this is compounded by the fact that in terms of, of Operation Paperclip, the, the Nazi pasts of many of these scientists was completely sanitized or, or completely right. overlooked, all in the name of, of stealing a march on, on the Soviet Union for technology. So, you know, it's, it's really kind of a um, sobering picture when you look at it and contemplate all the implications. There are two other things I wanted to bring up just at this at this exact period right after the war. Um, one of my favorite stories about that period is Dulles is sitting at at uh, Sullivan and Cromwell, and uh, Christopher Simpson in his book Blowback describes they've gotten they've they've laundered some of the money that they said was seized from the Nazis. Uh, it's it's money that the Nazis had seized from the Jews. It's come back from Switzerland. So we're assuming they made a deal. <laughs> and they've got the money in the Exchange Stabilization Fund, which in the United States is the mother of all slush funds. So they've got the money in the in the Exchange Stabilization Fund. Now, the Exchange Stabilization Fund is run by the New York Fed as agent for the Secretary of the Treasury, but the, it doesn't go through the governmental bureaucracy. It's direct to the Secretary of the Treasury. And my theory from everything I've seen is Sullivan and Cromwell has a very big hand in all of this and has for you know, for decades. But 
Um, so they're sitting there, and they've gotten a request by the Vatican to rig the Italian elections, and they use that money. And sometimes I say that the history of America is the story of how they keep replenishing that fund. Yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that... Uh, that so. <laughs> That that's that's the sixty four trillion dollar question. Right there. <laughs> um, and so, in the last round of bailouts, they got it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy, but, Catherine, that that's, well, that's let, Pandora's let me, box. I know it does, but I'll keep going because you know the, what we can do. We can open lots of boxes, and then we'll see where it goes. The well, other thing is. Uh, well, I wanted you to say a little bit about what technology the Nazis did have, because I grew up in Philadelphia, and the Philadelphia experiment had seared the psyche of the, you know, there was not a 33-degree mason who was not totally freaked out by the Philadelphia experiment in Philadelphia is the way I say it. And so it had, you know, it had hit the psyche in a noticeable way that I noticed even as a child, so... Maybe if you could say a little bit about what technology they had and how how it fits into this notion of a group of people who've gotten hold of the most advanced technology in the world. Well, that, this is all such a complex, interrelated story. Um, before I get to the technology, I, I think to, to address your comments about uh, Sullivan and Cromwell and the Dulles Brothers and, and the secret slush fund and, and the role of the New York uh, Federal Reserve Bank. Um, all I can tell you is that these are are the entities, the the institutions that keep recurring over and over and over in my research in connection with all of this. Because one of the things I try and do in in saucers, swastikas, and psyops, as you know, is is to point out that if you're going to have a situation of a breakaway civilization researching incredibly advanced technology, you have to have a reliable mechanism of financing it. And right. that mechanism has to be more or less independent of any sort of government oversight or, for that matter, uh, changing politics. You know, the wind blows one way today and, and blows another way tomorrow and your funding may be cut, even if it is covert. So my thinking was at that time, taking a page from what I saw happening at the end of World War II when the Nazis do their fair share to set up or, or bolster this hidden system of finance was that in reality I think what you have being created after the war, to put it in a nutshell, is a kind of detente that is struck between the, the surviving oligarchies of, of Nazi Germany on the one hand, and for that matter Imperial Japan, and the American financial oligarchs on the other. And, and we'll get back to why I think that there's this detente that at least was put into place at the end of, of World War II. But all of this is about technology, you're right. And, and in a nutshell, there is in Nazi Germany a project called the Bell, all right, Die Glocke in German. And there's a lot of people now that are trying to say that the bell was, was nothing but a kind of a glorified aspect of research for their atomic bomb project. Um, and they present some very uh, powerful, strong arguments, but I think there's a few details that they're missing. For my part, when I look at the bell project, um, I'm seeing a project that the Nazis conceived as a gateway technology for three purposes. And here's the three purposes. Number one, they want a technology that will give Germany a reliable energy supply free from the necessity of relying on petroleum. That's number one. Number two, they want a technology, and it's the same technology. It's, in other words, it's the same basic physics conceptions involved. They want a technology that will re lead to some sort of reliable field propulsion, or if you want to call it that, anti-gravity. And number three, Nazis being Nazis, after all, any time that you're, you're dealing with that kind of technology, they want to weaponize it. They want to create uh, some sort of doomsday weapon out of it. Now, 
if it sounds like I'm talking about flying saucers, yes, I am, and no, I'm not. The reason I'm not is that the Bell Project, the Bell was reportedly seen by witnesses, concentration camp witnesses, that were supposed to, uh, forced to be working on it. This was a device that was actually seen at night by some of these people to be levitating, but it wasn't maneuvering. It wasn't doing any fancy UFO maneuvers, but apparently the Germans did get this device, whatever it was, to some sort of pitch of development that it showed great promise. Now, the reason I'm belaboring all of this, Catherine, is that if we look in turn at the post-war fusion project that was going on in Argentina under Juan Perón and that was being conducted by this German scientist, his name was Dr. Ronald Richter, he was actually involved in this project back in Nazi Germany. So in other words, what we have is a continuation of this super-secret Nazi research project that was going on inside of the Third Reich during World War II. We have a continuation in Argentina of the very same project after World War II, and for that matter, when Perón exposes the project in 1951, six years after World War II. Now, this means you have organization. This means you have finance. This means you have a technical infrastructure in place that can get this scientist the necessary equipment, and on and on we could go. So the implications of it in terms of this idea of a breakaway civilization are rather breathtaking, and that implies in turn that the Nazis had a large pool of, of liquid capital that they could draw on after the war. And once we say that, we're dealing with what I think was really the hidden purpose of the formation of the Bilderberg Group. And, and let me explain that briefly. When you look at the founding of the Bilderberg Group, you have on the one side, you have on the Anglo-American side, of course, the involvement of the Rothschilds, the involvement of, of David and, and Lawrence Rockefeller, and so on and so forth. But on the European side, who do you have? You have a fellow by the name of Prince Bernhard, who is, of course, a kind of a minor German nobleman who marries into the Dutch royal family. And interestingly enough, Prince Bernhard held a managerial position during World War II in, guess who, IG Farben. So there's yet another Rockefeller German business connection. And in addition to that, Prince Bernhard was an SS officer. All right? Now, one of the major guests at these very early Bilderberg meetings was a fellow by the name of Dr. Hermann Josef Ops. And at that time in history, he was the CEO of Deutsche Bank. During the war, he was actually at a small handling bank in Berlin that did nothing but handle the government accounts of the Reich. In other words, this was the man that signed the check to pay Adolf Hitler's salary as chancellor. So what I suspect is going on at these early Bilderberg meetings is they're, they're dealing with all of this Nazi loot, and they're trying to figure out how they're going to move it into Western banks, and let's face the fact, what all of this liquid capital means is that these Western banks can then keep some of it off the books as a kind of a secret reserve. They vastly expand their ledger credit-making entry ability after the war. This, this would account for that massive post-war expansion of credit, this and some other things. And in the meantime, the Nazis have access to the financial markets. They're, in effect, laundering their money. And the thing that really drove this home for me, Catherine, was when I read a book by a former CBS journalist by the name of Paul Manning. He was a close associate of, of the old um, anchorman Ed Murrow. All right. Mm -hmm. Paul Manning wrote a book called Martin Bormann, Nazi in Exile, because his research had convinced him absolutely that, that the Nazi Party leader, Martin Bormann, had survived the war and was somehow kind of the the senior manager, so to speak, of this post-war Nazi enterprise, whatever you want to call it. And Manning came across something that dumbfounded him, and to this day it dumbfounds me. And that is, in the early 60s, Martin Bormann cashed a, a rather substantial check on Manufacturers Hanover and Chase Manhattan Bank, all right? 
Now, here's the real rub. He cashed the check over his own signature. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, what does that tell you right there? Uh -huh. And, and you know, to make matters much worse, <laughs> the check was cleared by Deutsche Bank in Buenos Aires. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, that, that little thing right there ought to tell everybody that, you know, we're dealing with, you know, the same old uh, nexus that occurred during the war between uh, American business and the Nazis. This nexus continues <laughs> after the war. Yeah, they continue to do business. And I want to throw in a couple of other things. We see the 47 and 49 Act, the National Security Act and the CIA Act passed in 47 and 49, which gives them, which gives the U.S. government the ability to appropriate money and then and then shift that money out of the agency it's designated for and have it disappear into the black budget on a non-accountable basis. So that's one. Then we see the second thing is the United States literally opened up to the drug trade coming from, where did it come from? Latin America. <laughs> and and that money is is literally used to lever, you know, the money in the black budget. And, and it's completely non-accountable. That's then laundered with mortgage securities and government securities fraud, which levers it to an even greater amount. But then to me, what the coup d'etat, are you ready for the coup d'etat? In 1980, George H.W. Bush, former head of the CIA, takes control. His deal with Reagan is he runs National Security Council and all intelligent enforcement. Uh, you know, that was the deal when he went on the ticket. He takes over and they engineer an executive order that qualifies private corporations to do, uh, to do, secret and highly classified functions uh, paid for by the U.S. government. So now you've, not only have you created a trillion dollar black budget, but now it can finance private corporations owning and controlling the most advanced technology in the world on a completely non-transparent, non-accountable basis. This is precisely the same structure that, that I'm seeing, Catherine. This, this right. nexus of people, high-level bureaucrats within intelligence, and the private corporate world with black budgets and secret research into, into, technolo into technology. The, the bad side of this is, since you mentioned Latin America and the drug trade and how American intelligence penetrated this, the other side of that coin is that the on-the-ground penetration by American intelligence of these drug cartels is being handled by the soldiers on the ground who are, guess what, Nazis. And the right. reason I say that, there's, there's an excellent book out by a fellow by the name of Henrik Kruger, and I cite this work in, in the Nazi International, the, the book of, of that title that I wrote. And Kruger points out that it's during the 60s and 70s that there's a massive restructuring of the way that the global drug trade is conducted. And the people behind this are attempting to take the French out of the picture. You know, this would explain many of the attempts on General de Gaulle's life. And the people behind this are attempting to restructure it. And as they're doing so, you find this huge penetration of the international drug trade by these post-war fascist networks, for want of a better expression. So you've got yet another nexus here in this breakaway civilization. You're dealing with vast amounts of very criminal money, as you point out, being laundered through banks, through government securities, and so on and so forth. And, and this whole vast enterprise, in turn, looks to, to be supporting some sort of vast secret research project of some sort. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in total agreement with you. This, this is exactly what I've been finding in my research. And I'm finding, you know, I'm doing a sequel to, to uh, Saucer, Swastikas, and PsyOps now. And, you know, the more I probe this whole area, um, this, this is the way the picture is increasingly coming to look. Uh, I think we're dealing with something huge. And, and the fraud involved is, is massive. Uh, yes. <laughs> there's there's right. just no other well, way of I, putting it. I always tell the story, and I'll tell it again now. I was um, in, in the early 90s, my company, I'd been the assistant secretary of housing at HUD, and then my company 
had later gotten hired back on competitive bid to, to be the lead financial advisor. And someone, I had an employee who worked for me, used to be on Senator D'Amato's staff, and she came to me and she said, look, I, I have a, you know, somebody who's an important constituent of the senator, and he really is desperate to see you. And I said, oh, all right. And the guy comes in, and we had made a huge effort to get audited financial statements required by law. And in 1995, they had finally published the first one. So I guess this was 1995. So in the spring of 1995, they come out with the first one. And this guy comes into my office, and he's carrying a huge stack of papers. And he sits down, and, he's, and here's his story. He says, you know, I'm a mortgage banker. My family's been more in the mortgage banking business for three generations. Our core competency is we track all FHA mortgages issued and he said I, I want you to know there's been a terrible terrible mistake um he said if you look at the balance sheet of these financial statements that have just been published it says that there's 400 billion of outstanding fha mortgage insurance and i said yes well you know being very proud of getting that law passed and he said there's a terrible mistake the actual number is several multiples of that now what he was saying was that the U.S. Treasury, the Department of Justice, HUD, J.P. Morgan Chase, and the New York Fed were engaged in massive, massive securities fraud. Well, I thought the guy was nuts. <laughs> so he said, I brought you a copy of my database. I said, no, that's okay. If I'd taken it, I'd probably be dead today. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, that's okay. You know, no, no. Now, it was after several years later when my litigation with the federal government just started and I started because I was bringing transparency to the mortgage portfolio I realized oh I better dig in and look at this and so I, I started to dig in and eventually came to the conclusion that the guy was right there was <laughs> several trillion you know several multiples of that and uh, it wasn't 400 billion it was in the trillions and in fact all of those entities were engaged in intentional organized massive securities fraud which of course now after 2008 everybody you know, that's common knowledge. But, you know, I think what is underestimated by many people is the extent of the financial resources that have been available to these folks for decades. This this is so true. And, and you know, the other thing that I'm running into, you're looking at securities, and it sounds to me from what you're describing that – the, the collateralization, so to speak, of these securities has been rehypothecated so many times and right. secretly. Well, I'm looking at, at a very similar phenomenon, uh, Catherine, and I, I ran across this in doing the research for saucers, swastikas, and psyops, and I'm writing about it in this book, and that is that the, the amount of gold reserves in the world, number one, the number itself appears to be massively obfuscated. And number two, the way I'm, I'm seeing things now, you know, let's go back to what I said earlier. We're looking at a, a post-war detente between elements of, of the Nazi oligarchy that, that survives World War II. And the reason they're left alone is, is they promise to move all of this money into Western banks. And they're, you know, bingo, right there. That's, that's one right. hidden reserve that, that these banks can call upon. But the other aspect of this is coming from the Pacific. And we need to remember that, the, you know, in addition to the Nazis plundering Europe, we have the Japanese plundering Asia. Right. And, again, I think that you have an element of, of collusion and post-war detente there where all of this vast amount of, of hard assets, bullion, gems, and so on and so forth, is placed at the disposal of the Western banks. And this hidden reserve has, the way it's looking to me, Catherine, has been rehypothecated so many times. And it truly is vast, not only the, the, the basis on which they're, they're floating these securities, but additionally the, the scale of, of rehypothecation is, is vast. And again, the question it raises to my mind, Catherine, is what are they doing with all of this money? It's obvious how they're laundering it, you know, mortgages and, and bonds and securities and derivatives and so on and so forth. But what are they using it for? And again, I go back to the fact that if, if we're dealing with technologies such as the Nazi bell, if on top of this you have an increasing, you know, phenomenally increasing 
presence of something in our skies, usually over military bases, and right. no one really knows what it is, then this is going to become a hot-button national security issue. And that, in turn, is going to foster a great deal of, of hidden and secret research. And I suspect that this is, in part, what explains it. I also suspect, like you put it earlier, that this has functioned as a, as a slush fund for all sorts of, of covert operations and, and uh, covert political activities. But, you know, this, if all of this is true, then, yes, we're looking at a breakaway civilization of some sort. Well, think of it this way. If it cost, let's just assume for a second it costs two trillion dollars or two to three trillion dollars to run, uh, you know, the equivalent of the United States government, or if you're being economic, a global government. Well, you know, at a at a five percent interest rate, if you get a big enough endowment, your dividends and interest will just produce that every year. Sure, exactly. So you can privatize the governance of the planet. And you, you can use the black budget to give you enough power and force to then take control of enough assets to give you an endowment that will generate, you know, a yield every year that's sufficient to run the run the entire government of the entire planet. Think of it as a leverage buyout of a planet. Yeah, exactly, exactly. This is precisely kind of the lines I'm pursuing right now, and, and this is exactly what I think is going on. The problem here, at least is at least the way it's looking to me, is that in researching the, the Nazi aspect of this, you know, I used, to, I used to like to quip, you know, whenever I would talk about this at conferences and so on, it's all fine and dandy for, for post-war Nazis and Western bankers to sit down and have their secret Bilderberg meetings and figure out what they're going to do with all this money, all right? But the man on the Nazi side, and I, I make no bones about it, I think Martin Bormann did survive the war, and I think he had a great deal of power and influence uh, in this post-war fascist network. Whenever you're dealing, you know, the, and these, these words, you know, are directed toward those Western financial oligarchs, whenever you're dealing with the likes of Martin Bormann, you're dealing with Dick Cheney and without the warmth and charm. At some point... <laughs> That right. marker is, is going to come due, and you're dealing with people that will maintain their private intelligence network after the war. They did maintain it. That's very clear. Um, and you're dealing with people that know where you are, and they're also involved in researching all of this advanced technology. So well, but, you, but you're also idea, dealing with a new generation, so they've had yes, kids exactly. and grandkids... So who's yes. really running it now? Exactly. This this is the question it raises for me, Catherine, because right. when you're dealing with something of this nature, you're dealing effectively with a hidden oligarchy. And like all oligarchies, it's going to have its internal factional disputes. And when you're dealing with, with oligarchs in turn that have access to some pretty sophisticated advanced technology, in addition to a vast slush fund for covert operations, the infighting could turn very nasty. You know, you're dealing quite right. literally with a kind of uh, mafia in a certain sense, each each faction being a family, you know, and, and one day they might all be gathered around a conference table and smoking and talking and exchanging pleasantries about how they're going to divide up the pot, and the next day they might be shooting at each other. Well, unfortunately, right. when we're talking about this kind of organization, when that shooting breaks out, they're not going to be shooting at each other with machine guns and, you know, all of, all of the mafia uh, stage setting. They're going to be shooting at each other with lasers and particle beams and, you know, right, and things that kill lots things. of other people. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So it's, it's, you know, the, the implications, really, I think, of, of the post-war period within American intelligence, within American finance, are immense because I think a deal quite literally was struck with, with the devil that we had just defeated in, in World War II. And... and that pretty much, uh, I think, is is partly what's what's going on now. I think it's partly behind the reason we see an increasingly fascist look to our culture, to our government, uh, to our institutions. I think that's part of it. Uh, I think partly we could be dealing with some massive 
uh, factional infighting of, of a sort going on as well amongst these people. One of the one of the reasons I think it's so important for many of us to explore and understand these things uh -huh. is uh, if you look at the official explanation of events. I told you on my drive out to Montana, I gave you a call and told you my story of the Indonesian tsunami. Yeah, which I've told our subscribers several times before, but for those of you who haven't heard it, I'll tell it again. Which is, um, I had done a lot of research and found a World Bond Fund for a person who bought it uh, right before the tsunami, a week before the tsunami, and it had 15% of its paper in, in the Indonesian sovereign debt. And then a week before the tsunami, right after they bought it, it dropped like a stone 15% overnight with massive insider trading. We couldn't figure out what is going on. There was nothing. Interest rates hadn't changed, nothing. And then a week later, the tsunami happened, and I realized, oh, my word, they knew. Now, yeah. In a world where people don't understand that a tsunami can be induced and people can make fortunes from doing that, yes, um, you know it's it's depressing to understand that, but it's very helpful to understand that such weaponry exists. Yes, so, it does. Um, there, th this is this is what people have to understand, Catherine. Um, the technologies that we're talking about that that we're suggesting are number one, they're technologies that to a certain extent are capable of manipulating planetary systems, in other words, weather, um, earthquakes, things, things of this sort. And this is why I'm extremely suspicious of all of the talk now in, in certain financial elite circles about weather derivatives, because really this is a signal to me that they're planning to manipulate these systems for their own fun and profit just as you right. said with, with the Indonesian uh, tsunami. But the third thing that I think we need to understand about these things is that, once again, we're looking at the signature, I think, of this breakaway civilization. And the reason why is we have to go back to that nexus between finance and intelligence. What all of these types of technologies are really suggesting is that Mother Nature is the perfect plausible deniability. In other words, right. you can fight wars using weather. You can fight wars using earthquakes, tsunamis, and so on and so forth, hurricanes, tornadoes, if you have the technology to do it, because that technology will also allow you, if, if, if you're potential target doesn't have that technology or know how knows how it works, then, yeah, you, you've got the perfect condition to say, well, this was just an act of God. This was just an act of Mother Nature. And in all honesty, I think we need to go back, Catherine, and do just exactly what you suggested with Indonesia. We need to look at convenient natural disasters. Uh, we need to look at Fukushima. We need to look at Haiti. We need to look at Chile. Uh, we need to look at some of these things and, and do exactly what you did and look at financial activities and, and anything of the sort that, that could indicate that these were not entirely uh, right. natural events. And think about it. Think, for example, if you're, the, if you're the head of the Swiss government and they come and tell you you're going to go off the gold standard. Right. And if you don't do that, you're going to have earthquakes. How can right. you turn to your population and build local support to support you in, exactly. in stopping this? You can't exactly. because your population can't fathom that it exists. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, this is, this is why I spend so much time with what the Nazis, what I think they were really up to during World War II, with this Bell Project, and, and for that matter, some of their other projects, because what they were attempting to do in my opinion, you know, this is this is an interpretation of, of the data set. And in my opinion, what they were attempting to do was to find a physics and a technology based upon that physics that would allow you to engineer the fabric of space-time, so to speak, on the laboratory bench. And I put it in that peculiar sense because, indeed, if you go back and look not necessarily at the scientific papers that were published between the wars, 
But at the engineering papers that were published between the wars, you'll run into a, a genius electronic engineer by the name of Gabriel Krohn. And this is a key part of the story here since you mentioned the Philadelphia experiment. Gabriel Krohn was a man who published a paper that won him the Montefiore Prize at the University of Liège in Belgium. And in the paper, what he suggested was that electrical engineers who dealt with large networked rotating electrical systems on a regular basis always noticed anomalous things in, in their systems. And in looking for an explanation for what was going on, he stumbled across some of the early unified field theory papers of Albert Einstein. And he took Einstein's tensor calculus, which up to this point had not been used in any sort of physics application, much less an engineering application, other than the physics of very large-scale things like stars, galaxies, and so on and so forth. And he said, no, we can use the same mathematical technique to explain what's going on in our electrical systems. Now, that may sound like a mouthful, but when you stop and consider what he's actually said, in 1935 is that, therefore, the fabric of space-time is engineerable locally with standard off-the-shelf 1935 technology. Well, guess what? At this instant, at the instant that this paper receives the prize at the University of Liège, which of course is right over the border from Germany, all publication on, on unified field theory matters inside of the Third Reich stops cold <laughs> in the tracks. Gabriel Crone put a lid meantime, on that guy. <laughs> oh yeah, you know Gabriel Crone. In the meantime, he was a Jewish man, so he emigrated out of Europe to the United States, where he ends up as one of the senior engineers at guess what, General Electric. And if you know the Philadelphia experiment story, it's General Electric, which is one of the major suppliers allegedly of the equipment on, mm -hmm. on the USS Eldridge for the Philadelphia experiment. So, do I think that? We created a, a bureaucracy in this country to investigate some of this physics. Well, you betcha. You know, if, if the you Nazis are do. doing it, we're going to do it too. <laughs> you know? yeah. so, but I think the I think, problem in in this country was that the corporations got control of the technology. The government lost control. Yeah, that's they got, exactly they got my the right take to too. finance it, but they didn't. They didn't get to keep control. Exactly, that's my take too, and the reason why I see this as a pattern here is because you see the same thing going on inside of the Third Reich. Um, Albert Speer, who was the, the German armaments minister during World War II, the latter portion of World War II, wrote a whole book. And the book was about how Himmler was attempting to set up the entire SS as a kind of uh, completely off-the-books hidden economy. Of course, part of that is based on, on the slave labor available to them in the, in the camps. But the other thing that it means is that what you, in effect, had was a bureaucracy of the government that was attempting to sever all ties from the Reich government completely, and even, for that matter, from the Nazi party, and assume unto itself a completely hidden system of finance, a completely hidden system or network of research centers. And, and, and the centers, you know, everybody's read about the underground factories and so on and so forth that the Allies found after World War II. Well, Catherine, these facilities that, that we found in, in Western Germany are nothing compared to the scale of what existed in Eastern Europe in terms of size, right. in terms of, of right. function. So you have, you know, you have the same thing going on in Europe as you have in America. So when we when we factor that into this post-war détente, yeah, I think what you're looking at is is a basically fascist culture that existed within certain high levels of of American corporate power to begin with. After all, they're they're helping finance Hitler, and after the war, they just pick up where they left off, and you know, all, we're all friendly and brotherly again, and we're going to continue our special projects. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the time you're talking, I keep hearing that line from Leonard Cohen's song, first we take Manhattan, then we take Berlin. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's right. There you go. I wanted to bring up, um, uh, you know, on the Solaria Report, we often do something called Let's Go to the Movies because I found in America that fiction is fact and fact is fiction and that, you know, a lot of what's going on comes out via Hollywood. It's kind of like a steam valve. They they kind of have a way of telling people about it. But I, I if, in Let's Go to the Movies today, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about The Forgotten. I don't know if you've seen it by any chance. It's a uh, oh boy! Sort of a psychological thriller <laughs> about a woman in in New York. This, you this one? you're talking about the movie with Julianne Moore. Yes. All right, I, you're you're not going to believe that. I just watched that movie this you're afternoon. You're kidding! No, <laughs> <laughs> just before the show. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we're you well, know synchronicity it, again. We've done several programs on mind control, so it's something I've touched on before, but one of the things I've found, you know, whether it's mind control targeted in, in, at an individual in the, the movie They're Forgotten is a story of a woman whose son has been kidnapped, and, um, and it's an effort uh, by a group of people, including the U.S. intelligence agencies, to see if they can get away with this and get all the parents to forget that the kids existed. You know, and in the movie, it seems like a much more bizarre thing, you know, but things like this do go on. Um, although, you know, I've never seen it go on in that sort of group scale. But what I found is that one of the reasons that groups like the ones we're talking about, the breakaway civilization, are so successful is their mind control technology is un- extraordinary. Um, and, of course, now it's not just targeted in individuals, you know, what you can do with one Manchurian candidate or one person, but, you know, what you can do with entrainment technology on scale. But these are a, p- a group of people who've invested enormous scientific and research resources and, you know, billions of dollars in understanding the human mind and how they can control and manipulate it. Right, So, right. I, I, What did you think of for the forgotten, I have to ask you? Well, you know, to me, the movie is very dark, but the underlying message to it, I think, is very, very interesting. The message is, okay, there's a, there's a bunch of missing children, number one. Number two, we have technologies to, and techniques to make you forget, except in a case where the bond of love is so strong, we can't break it down. So in other words, the underlying message of the movie is you've got a bunch of materialists thinking that they can engineer everything through through technology, and in the end, it falls just short of being able to break down uh, the barriers of to personality and will and conscience that is informed by love. Right. And, and you notice the, that the politicians who get shot are the ones who are talking about love. Yes. Exactly. Kennedy, Malcolm, e- Malcolm X exactly. starts talking about love, and the next thing you know, he gets shot. He's and shot. That's because love is very dangerous to this group. Yes, it is. And I think, you know, we could, we could be all night talking about this subject, but, you know, I have a number of books that I've written about what I call the, the, the topological metaphor of the physical medium. And, and the bottom line is if you really understand the basis of this metaphor, it's a, it's a highly mathematical concept, to be sure, but you find it over and over again in ancient religions, uh, philosophical, metaphysical systems, and so on and so forth. And, and the bottom line is really that it's a metaphor of love, is what it is. And this is, this is what cannot be broken down through, through any merely... Uh, materialistic technology or technique. But it is true, on the other hand, I think you're absolutely right, that one of the signatures of this breakaway civilization is, to my mind anyway, at least at least in the books I've been researching on this post-war Nazi theme, is that in order to conceal the, the truly cosmic technology that you're trying to perfect and develop, you are going to want to pursue every available technology and every available technique to obfuscate that technology in case anyone happens to see it. 
investment. Right. And and this is you know this is I think an an integral part of this breakaway civilization. Because the other the other side of this coin, Catherine, is that we've had since the Second World War, we've had an enormous increase in the frequency of UFO sightings. And at least some of those, to my mind, represent a technology, whether it's from here or off planet, who knows. But, you know, I certainly think some of it is coming from somewhere else or someone else. And if that be the case, then you know that the people in the national security establishments of the major powers of the world are going to take immediate steps to at least be able to defend themselves just as a matter of national security against this technology. And that means they're going to put in a, into place a, a program and technologies to obfuscate the issue, uh, force people to, to ask the wrong questions or, or interpret it the wrong way. So I think we're looking at you know something truly huge. It has huge financing. It has breathtaking technology. It has an extensive intelligence network, uh, both for covert operations and intelligence gathering. And on top of that, it's dealing with huge problems. Um, Right. There's a there's another player on the block that I don't think they anticipate. Right. The situation is we've got we've got powerful uh, weapons in the hands of people in an in, insecure situation. Exactly. 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 And you add to that, oh. I think you add to that the it, it's it's kind of hard because you're kind of skipping in and out. And I hope I'm not talking over you. If I have been, I no apologize. no no no. But sometimes, sometimes the connection skips in and out, and I don't actually hear if you're talking. But um, the other thing that's very, very significant to me, at least with the whole idea of this breakaway civilization, is the, is the idea of factional infighting. I do think that there is a lot of internal stress amongst this financial oligarchy that we see trying to run things all their own way. Um, I do think there's a possibility that there's some powerful internal struggles as to who's going to emerge on top of all of this. And to a certain extent, I think if you read certain signs carefully, I think there's a little measure of panic uh, in certain Western oligarchical circles that uh, I think is going to increase. And you think that's because they literally don't, have the ability to defend against some of the other factions. I yes, I do. I think to a certain extent and and I'll give you the kind of model that's been in my head and the way I'm I'm kind of looking at things now. It may change as as I get more information, but it's looking to me, Catherine, that I go back to what I said about, you know, this post-war détente when you're striking a deal with any sort of post-war international fascist body, you're, you're dealing with Dick Cheney without the warmth and charm. And they've moved a lot of money into Western banks. But at some point, you know, since we've used the mafia model before, at some point that marker is going to come due. And if you can't pay up, then they're going to send a gorilla over to your store and bust your kneecaps. Or in this case, right. they're going to do something to show you that they mean business. And that they want, you know, they want what's coming to them. I think that there okay. So are was that was that what happened with the bailouts? In other words, did they say, "Look, we're going to pull the money, we're going to crash the money markets, and if you don't refinance out all this paper, you know, we'll pull the plug, and we can." Right. I strongly suspect, Catherine, that the bailouts were a signal of some sort, precisely of that nature, that it was a signal of one faction to another. Uh, I go back to something that struck me. I, I don't know if it struck you as peculiar, but it struck me as mighty peculiar at the time. And that was this request, as the bailout hearings were proceeding, that there be no oversight. Well, at the time, my reaction, Catherine, was, okay, someone has kidnapped a loved one, and they've told you not to go to the police, but you've got to raise the money for the ransom. 
So you go to a bank, you, you extend your hand, you need all of this money, you can't say why other than, you know, you've got a family member kidnapped, but no one is to follow you, there's to be no police surveillance, otherwise the, the, the deal is off. So in other words, the behavior of, of people coming to Congress and asking for bailout money and then saying we can't, we can't uh, afford to have any oversight, that to me is the behavior of someone with a gun being held to their head. Well, it's also that, something else. There, there's the, there's the, that gun. There's also the fact that you have so much fraudulent paper, yes. with so much individual and institutional criminal liability, Yep. That in an environment where the factualism is severe, you are going to have real problems with people using that, you know, transparency of those criminal liabilities against each other, and it could tear the entire financial system apart. Precisely, precisely. So that's that's essentially what I'm seeing. I, yes. That's the gun. And the other part of this gun, I think we have to, as you, as you averred with your comment about Indonesia and the strange trading that was taking place prior to it, I think the other side of this gun is that there have been technological demonstrations that we have a technology and we can use it. Someone is, you know, to me, the way it appears, and I'll be very blunt, maybe this will, this will put it in, in better perspective. To me, it is looking like that post-war detente deal is off. It, I know, think it there's, feels like that. Pardon me? It feels, it feels like it's coming unglued. Yes, exactly. I'm looking at, you know, I don't know how else to put it, but when I'm looking at the situation in Europe with all of these, you know, you began the program talking about the, the European Central Bank essentially coming up with a scheme to, to fund bonds into infinity. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and the way I'm looking at this is from a rather different perspective. It's, it's kind of a long-term uh, geopolitical point of view. And that is that the whole principle of British and then later American geopolitics throughout the 19th and 20th centuries has been to prevent Russia or China from ever reaching any sort of accord or rapprochement, and secondly, to Let prevent alone Russia doing it with Germany. Yeah, the other one is Germany, yeah. and yeah. the way this European sovereign debt crisis looks to me is that it has an underpinning geopolitical agenda to it, and that agenda is to keep Germany firmly locked into the European Union by means of becoming the creditor nation to the rest of right. Europe. And, you know, it, it remains to be seen whether the Germans are going to do that, you know, because their economic interests, their, their, their national security interests, really don't lie in Europe at all. You know, they're such huge trading partners with China. You know, the German export economy is enormous. And none of it really is is tied all that tightly into the rest of Europe. It is, it's more uh, these specialized shops and so on, but trading with, with Asia. And certainly their energy uh, needs are being increasingly met from, from Asian from sources, Russia. from Russian yeah. sources. So it appears to me that there's some sort of geopolitical agenda going on behind this, this European sovereign debt crisis as well. Well, um before we close, you must once again describe your website and how we can access your books and how we can stay current on what you're doing. Because you do webcasts as well, right? Yeah, I do. Uh, I have a subscribers area on my website where I post kind of private research papers on various topics. I don't post very many, but I do post some there. Uh, simply my book writing takes too much time, you know, for writing. But uh, on certain subjects, I do post uh, papers there. And, and I do... You know, I'm, I'm uh, glad you feel that it's hard to write as many books as you do because I, when I see how many books you've written, I think, how in the world does he do it? <laughs> well, I'm, ba <laughs> I'm basically <laughs> stuck here in my office 24-7 in front of my computer. That's how I do it. It's quiet <laughs> you know, in I South have... Dakota. 
yeah, I take you know I take a break a break to eat and and shower and so on, but you know that's <laughs> and sleep, but that's about it. Um, no, the website is is called www. GizaDeathStar.com. That's all one word, all lowercase. Uh, I do have a web store there on the website that that people can can order my books right off the website. Um, which you know, if they do it that way, it does give me a few extra pennies per per book on on royalties and so on. But uh, basically, the reason I write so many books is is I've I found what happens to all authors when when they become self-supporting, then you have to keep a certain pace of, of research and writing going in order to maintain that. So mm-hmm. hopefully the website, you know, the income from that will generate a little bit more time so that I can take things <laughs> at a more <laughs> leisurely pace. <laughs> well, I have to tell you what you've accomplished is extraordinary, and I hope that everybody in the Salary Report Network uh, takes advantage of what you have to offer because it's very special, and I can't thank you enough for joining us. And if there's anything I can do to help, I'm going to write up my stories and send them to you um, before I leave Montana. And But if there's oh, anything wonderful. else I can I, do to help with your well, work and research. Do you have a title when, yet? When you, yeah, I, I do. It's, it's, it's up at Amazon. It's called Covert Wars and Breakaway Civilizations. Oh, Sounds yeah, ooh. <laughs> it's, it's it's the sequel to Saucers, Swasticas, and Psyops. So I'm kind uh-huh. of you know in, in the Saucers book, I was kind of approaching things from the Nazi side of the equation. In this book, I'm approaching things more from from the standpoint of the Western side of the equation. Right. So I, uh, I have to tell you this: when I first saw the documentary Phoenix Lights, have you ever watched that? Oh yes, uh-huh. Yeah, so I, I was in the in the process of writing lots of stories about the there's 4 trillion dollars that went missing from federal accounts between um fiscal 1998 and 2002. So I'm yapping on and on about the 4 trillion of missing money and and so I was watching Phoenix Lights with a group of friends and I saw the UFO sort of float down you know the interstate and I said I stopped and I said, you know, I bet you Lockheed Martin would build that for four trillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. It could buy you a lot of UFOs. <laughs> it can buy you a lot of UFOs. Well, here's the interesting thing: the the financial system at the end of the day is a harvesting machine, and if you if you understand it as a harvesting machine that's basically producing a tithe, then the question is, well, where's that tithe going? And how much is it after the last hundred years of being generated? And what are they doing with it? And what do they need that money for? Because it's a very, you know, when you step back at the end of the day, it's a harvesting. And a lot of it is going into space or space research or, you know, some such thing. Because we're we're talking about trillions more than would buy, you know, every Wall Street partner a Ferrari and an offshore bank account. Oh, I absolutely yeah. agree. I absolutely agree. You know, putting it that way really points out that that what we're dealing with in a certain sense is a a Manhattan project thing on steroids. Yeah. yeah. And and I think space, you know, the only thing to my mind that could suck up a budget that huge would be something concerning space. And underground facilities. Big, and underground big facilities, big absolutely. Facilities. Yeah. Well, Dr. Farrell, it's been an absolute pleasure. Please let us know what we can do to support you in the writing of this next book. And we just, you know, we wish you Godspeed. Well, thank you, Catherine. It's been an honor and, and, and great fun to be on your show. Mm-hmm.